Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today joined by a very special guest, portfolio founder and CEO of PAVE, uh, Matt Shulman. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Eric, great to be here. I'm excited. Looking forward to it. Likewise. So, so, so Matt, for, for the audience that may be unfamiliar, uh, although if you, if you keep track of hot startups, uh, you, you'll, you'll definitely know of PAVE. <laughs> Tell us what is PAVE and how you came to start it. Yeah. So PAVE is a, a compensation startup. We help companies plan, communicate, and, and benchmark compensation against the market in real time. And uh, it's kind of a funny story how I got into this. A lot of people look at my profile. They see I was an engineer. They're like, how the heck did you get into compensation? But uh, for me, I've always kind of been a personal finance nerd. Uh, I was always kind of the friend in my group that would uh, get bombarded with the questions about 401ks, IRAs, you know, the mega backdoor Roth conversion, stuff like that. So uh, needless to say, I I spent a lot of my free time making apps kind of in this uh, general realm of personal finance. And after I graduated from college, I spent a little bit over a year traveling and spent a lot of time working on one app that was called Dollar Z. That was basically a, a personal financial literacy app. That one didn't really take off, but it was a really fun experience. And eventually came to the Bay Area and was at uh, Facebook as an engineer for a couple of years. But you know, I quit a little bit over two years ago in the summer of 2019. And you know, naturally, I was uh, sort of pulled back towards personal finance. And once again, took another stab. This time, it was on an app called Parable. And, you know, we were syncing with Twala, with Plaid, we were kind of making like a, a supercharged mint on steroids. And once again, it wasn't exactly the right model, but uh, it, it eventually led me uh, to having a lot of customer conversations uh, kind of in the fall of 2019. So literally two years ago to the day, and a lot of customers started to lend, lament to me about stock options uh, and, and about how just confusing it was and how they're, you know, competing with other companies, big tech companies giving out liquid RSUs and, you know, they're trying to sell their ISOs. Uh, so I thought this was just like a really intriguing kind of initial pain point. Uh, so I really double clicked there. And, and the deeper I got in, the more I realized that compensation is just a, a fascinating discipline. You know, it's the most expensive, you know, item on most companies balance sheet. It's also one of the most broken aspects of the global labor economy. So the deeper I got in, the more obsessed I got with the problem. And then, uh, you know, the rest is history from there. Yeah, that's fascinating. There's so much we can go, go into from there. Let, let's start with what's broken in compensation today. Well, I'd say the, the biggest thing is that compensation is pretty much offline right now. Uh, if you want to find out how much to pay somebody, uh, you kind of are looking at these offline data sets that are you know, a year stale. And especially in the market that we're in right now, that's moving so quickly, uh, that's just not going to cut it. I mean, over the last year, engineering salaries have gone up by about 20%. So if you're looking back in time, you're just never going to be calibrated with the market. So it's basically this finger in the air exercise and we're in the dark ages and, and the key kind of revolution that we're just starting to see now is the transition from the offline world to the online world. So I'd say that's the biggest thing that is just broken with the ecosystem at large. And, and what, what changes when you, can, when, you can, when you can go online? Well, suddenly you can have precision in terms of how much to pay people. And because of this precision, you can use data that you actually trust to back every single offer, every single promotion. And this just breeds a, a new kind of era of, of transparency and of fairness where you can look to the data behind every decision instead of sort of looking to the political nature of how a lot of compensation decisions are made today. And so why hasn't this been done before? Or, or why hasn't this worked before? Uh, maybe in, maybe just broader talk about how compensation across industries has, has evolved over time. Yeah. I mean, you know, for the most part, like there, there's a couple of incumbent data sets that have been around for a, a few decades, but I, I think there's kind of this underlying force that was uh, has enabled innovation to happen in this space. Uh, and that is mainly that you know, data exists in, in these online systems in a way it didn't before. So on the candidate side, we, we now see kind of like greenhouse and lever kind of getting ubiquitous adoption, you know, cap tables now pretty much every startup is using either a Carta or a Shareworks or a pulley or something in that realm. And this just simply was not the case five years ago, 10 years ago. So I think that's the enabling force at a high level is that data now sits in these online systems and is portable. Um, but what really kind of kickstarted things, I, I would say, is uh, all the kind of the transformations that happened in the labor economy due to coronavirus. You know, we sort of entered this global experiment with remote work, and this experiment has been successful for the most part. We've realized that remote work does work, but that has just wreaked havoc on how compensation works in terms of your philosophy about how much to pay that you know engineer that left SF and moved to 
Jackson, Wyoming, as an example. Uh, meanwhile, we've seen a, a much greater emphasis over the past year, year and a half on uh, diversity and inclusion. A lot of it was sparked by the uh, you know, Black Lives Matter movement last summer. So there's just a lot of flux in the labor economy right now, not to mention the whole great resignation movement. Uh, and as a result, uh, this has sort of acted as a catalyzing force, kind of a pressure cooker per se, uh, that has made compensation just a high level, you know, board level conversation in a way that it simply was not two, three, four years ago. So now the data is in these portable systems. It's like one of the most talked about things. And that has been the perfect kind of uh, storm or recipe for this whole new wave of innovation and compensation. And, and the other thing you didn't mention that we talked a, a, a lot a bit about is the um, just what we're seeing in the venture market today and how that's affecting the, the labor market as well. Why don't you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, it's one of the hottest private markets that we've seen in quite some time, public market, of course, as well. So that definitely impacts equity compensation. It, it just changes how candidates think about equity compensation. It, it changes how companies administer it. It changes how dilution works. Part, part of that is also that companies are sitting on a lot more capital requisite at their stage than previously uh, was the case in the past. And this all trickles down to candidates. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why uh, candidates now have a lot more uh, power, like bargaining power when they're negotiating an offer letter. There's just a lot more capital sort of going around as we enter more of this inflationary period. So it's one of the underlying reasons why uh, wage rates have gone way up, especially in tech where the private markets are especially hot. You know, what's interesting. I, I imagine there'll be a world where imp- candidates are running processes the way, or employees are running processes the way that founders run processes, right? They line up all the companies, <laughs> I'm going to do it over the next two weeks, I'm going to run a process, and they kind of just run an auction. <laughs> That's funny. That yeah. Happen? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to an extent, I, I think just candidates, like especially the, uh, the the truly high caliber ones, realize how much leverage they have in, in a way that was just never the case. Uh, Eric, part of the underlying cause here is that you know they're not just looking at jobs in SF. I see so many candidates that are maybe based in SF looking at SF jobs, but they're also looking at jobs that are remote or all over the country or in Europe because of uh, the increasing prevalence of remote work. So they have all this leverage. Uh, they have kind of all this like real time data at their fingertips. You know, obviously with Pave, we're a little bit more focused on the B two B angle, but you know, we also see Levels.FYI as an example of you know kind of this like consumer data set that is just growing uh, at a rapid pace. So you know, there's a lot going on. Candidates have a lot more access to data. They have a lot more leverage, and absolutely, I'm seeing them line it up like a VC process. It's kind of funny to make that analogy, though. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess one reason why they don't do it. So explicitly is because most of them are still at their current job. So it only ha- it'd have to be for people who've, who've you know who've openly left, or it's it's I mean that's or it's secretly, and that's what hired tried to do as well. Um, yep, yep, exactly. It, or tried to facilitate, it. and I guess some people you know do run fundraising processes sort of secretly. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see just because that's sort of the logical conclusion of just employees having all the leverage. And it, right now, it just, it, it's an inefficient market. There's no way for employees to see all the people that want them and what they would pay for them. Yes, exactly. It, it, I think one of the reasons why candidates might, or I mean, even if they're, they haven't left the job yet, the, the reason they might feel comfortable sort of running this secret process per se, uh, is that we were in this like really kind of uncertain period for a year where there was so much just uh, uncertainty around their lives and coronavirus and the vaccine and everything. But things are a lot more certain than they were previously. So as a result, they're willing to take that leap of faith, even if it means you know uh, running a process while they're still employed by a company. I see so many engineers, as an example, that are willing to do moonlighting as you know, kind of contract dependent to hire setups at early stage startups. Uh, that I, I don't know if that was the case or it was as prevalent maybe two years ago. Yeah, talk talk more about the um, the great resignation. Uh, you know, what what is it, or what what have we actually seen, and and what does it mean? So, yeah, I think uh, there's kind of two key underlying forces, uh, at least from my perspective. Uh, the first one I would say is that churn is way up, uh, like employee churn. And it sort of ties into the point I was just making about uncertainty. Uh, there is less uncertainty now if you're a candidate. Anecdotally, I have so many friends that, you know, a year ago, we were in the dark days of the pandemic. It was unclear if the vaccine was going to be rolled out. It was unclear exactly, you know, what the public and private markets were doing. Uh, so as a result, you know, in, in a period with such macro uncertainty, they wanted to really cling on to their jobs because that was one of their uh, true sources of stability. But now, you know, it, it's been two, three years, perhaps, since a lot of high caliber tech candidates have, uh, you know, switched jobs or made a career change. So, OK, now it's like a, a time where they're excited to go out to the market and see what they're worth uh, to, you know, the point we were making about leverage. So churn is way up. Uh, and then the second thing we see is that you know, because of all the, the capital that are in the private markets and, and how hot the public markets are, 
Companies have more capital on hand, especially in tech, and they're willing to pay more. So it's a hot market. Churn is up. And you know what is the result of this? Uh, well, uh, wage rates are also way up. I mentioned this earlier, but uh, we see that software engineering salaries are up by about 20% over the last year. It's just crazy to see you know, what engineers are getting paid today. And, and I, I think that's kind of a result of this whole great resignation movement. So as it pertains to churn, we do see that uh, the employee churn rates are about two times what they were at this time last summer, if you think about it, when we were kind of in the middle of the, the earlier days of the pandemic. So yeah, those are some of the high level thoughts on the great resignation. Uh, a lot of people ask, hey, fact or fiction? We definitely say fact. We definitely see from the data that it is a real phenomenon happening. And, and so do you expect, um, how do you expect this to evolve? Do you expect the duration of, of employees at, at companies to only, that duration to only diminish over time? Or, or, or what do you see? What do you predict? I do predict that there is going to be an, a prolonged period where candidates continue to have a lot of leverage. Part of it is due to just like the perception that you can go to the market and, and get a higher uh, yeah. kind of wage rate. But part of it is also just like from a supply and demand perspective, the supply is now 10x what it was before because of the fact that remote work, like there are so many startups that were founded in the coronavirus era that are now 100% remote or like fully hybrid. So for folks looking to go to like one of those hot earlier stage startups, there was just like a plethora of opportunity that did not exist before. And part of that is for folks in San Francisco, but honestly, anywhere, anywhere in the world, you can work, you can go to a hot startup. And before there was a, a much smaller kind of cohort of startups that actually, you know, promoted remote work as a first class citizen, you know, such as uh, what's the company in Atlanta? Well, there's a few of them, but yeah. So it's just the supply is like 10x what it used to be. Yeah, no, that, that that's really interesting. Let's, uh, we've been talking about remote versus you know, hybrid or, or in person, or, or just the, sort of that change uh, in terms of remote work proving that 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 it can be successful, effective for for lots of companies. Um, of course, there are sort of the age old compensation practice questions around. You know, how, how do you compensate people who are in person versus remote versus versus hybrid, and uh, you know, accounting for cost of living? What are people doing, and and what what do you recommend? So, in general, there's kind of two different prevailing philosophies, and it, they're not necessarily uh, you know mutually exclusive. You can sort of be a little bit in between, but on the one end of the spectrum, uh, you have kind of the notion of like pain uh, based off the localized either cost of living or cost of labor. Usually, cost of labor if you can get data. Otherwise, you can make it a you know sort of an estimate based off the cost of living delta between two different locations. Uh, that has been the prevailing philosophy. Although today there are some companies that say. Uh, and this is more of the free market theorem. They say, it doesn't matter where you're located. We're going to pay you the same amount of money. We care about your output rather than your input. So you know, to summarize, we have on one side, the cost of you know, labor rhetoric. And then on the other side, we have the free market rhetoric. And um, I think the free market principles were, were generally uh, less prevalent, but we're seeing that they're becoming more and more prevalent uh, today. Reddit is an example of a company that is very public and vocal about the notion of hey, it doesn't matter where you're located, we will pay you the same amount of money. And with the prevalence of remote work, uh, it has sort of just tipped the markets a little bit in this direction towards this like free market theorem where it doesn't matter where you're located, you're going to get paid the same. Um, and we're, we're seeing this in the data too. So an example is uh, we looked at the delta uh, between tier one markets and tier three markets for senior software engineers two years ago versus what we're seeing today. And, and what we saw two years ago, you know, tier one being like San Francisco, New York, et cetera, tier three being, you know, other markets in the United States that aren't as hot. Uh, what we saw two years ago is that it was about an 18% delta. And what we're seeing today is that it's about a 5% delta for offer letters that have been signed in the last three months or so. So this is sort of like a, a macro observation that we are trending in this free market sort of direction where it, it really is just about the output of your work rather than where you're located. Yeah. And it makes sense as the market gets more efficient, if other people are going to pay at market rate, you know, you're going to lose those people unless you, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, it makes sense that the price would, would get bid up in that way. Let, let, let's zoom out um, just in terms of you, you guys are sitting on all, all this data, you know, what, what are some of the best practices or, or common pitfalls for, for founders to, to avoid? Well, I, I'd say the number one most important thing is consistency. All the times I see as companies are scaling, they make mistakes because they're are inconsistent practices that are preached between different departments or between different candidates. You know, it, it's very easy in the heat of the moment to make an exception for one particular candidate or one particular manager because you know there's a burning need to hide or to hire a particular uh, you know role or discipline. Um, however, the, the unfortunate thing about compensation, especially equity compensation, is that a lot of simple decisions that you make in the short run end up being kind of these one-way doors that are very difficult 
uh, to, you know, retroactively uh, course correct if possible at all. So, you know, for instance, with equity, once you give a grant to somebody, uh, if there's a small delta today between two different candidates, because you were willing to make a, you know, an exception based off some negotiation pattern or something of that nature, if the valuation of the company, you know, 2X is 5X is 10X is, that delta just gets bigger and bigger over time. And it's not like you can erase that kind of gap in the equity. So, uh, the point that I'm making here is I strongly recommend that founders have some sort of you know consistent philosophy that they preach between different candidates, between different departments. And it doesn't need to be overkill. It doesn't need to be like a 10-page document, but something as simple as saying, hey, we look at market data and we've made a decision as a company to pay, I don't know, the 75th percentile for cash and the you know 90th percentile for equity or something like that. Uh, it's just like a strong, strong, strong stance that you can make that doesn't take that much time to do in the short run. And will save you so many nightmares in the long run because you know inevitably at any company people become close with each other and when you're not there you know as the founder they're going to talk by the water cooler and eventually they're going to talk about compensation so if you're if that makes you squirm if you're not comfortable with that it means that you probably don't have fair uh, you know practices in place today on, on that note you know some companies have experimented with compensation transparency what, what is your perspective on on that in terms of people you know people at the company well, in, in general, I, I, I tend to be a very transparent person, not just with the compensation, but with everything. Uh, as it pertains to compensation, our, our company mission is to make compensation more transparent and fair for all constituents, You know, that being candidates, employees, uh, founders, uh, managers, et cetera. However, I, I do respect that different companies have different philosophies and stances on exactly what level of uh, transparency they, they want to sort of abide by. Uh, so we respect that. We respect that there are different types of businesses, different use cases, and in different contexts where you might want to share the fully diluted share counts or you might not want to. Um, we do sort of view there uh, being a, a, a minimum bar that all companies should abide by. And, and we have a blog post on this on our website, but uh, there is kind of a minimum sort of standard that we expect people to listen to. Uh, but for the, the ultra transparent things that we see from companies, you know, GitLab, I know, has always evangelized this notion of being ultra transparent. Um, it is up to the company to determine the culture that they want. Uh, we're willing to support that. But in general, we do want to see a movement in the industry where we move towards transparency and towards fairness. Do you do you see um, or believe in the concept of, um, you know, there was a meme, right? The 10X engineer. <laughs> but like to the extent that there are <laughs> super, you know, LeBron James makes a lot more money than, you know, uh, someone else, Kyle Kuzma or whoever. Uh, on the, like, <laughs> do equivalents exist among uh, employees? And um, I guess that, that's just a risk in terms of transparency if, if there's just vast differences and they're not easily explainable in the way that, you know, it's easier to explain LeBron, perhaps? <laughs> well, I mean, look, LeBron is like the most uh, dominant player of our generation. Well, I mean, that's debatable, but you know what I'm saying. So yeah. I, I think that is fair, right? Like he, he brings, uh, you know, fans to the audience. He he dominates the game. He, what, what do you have? Like nine straight NBA finals. That's just absolute dominance. So he deserves to be paid more. I think that is completely fair. And, you know, he probably makes orders of magnitude more than some of like a rookie in the NBA. That's totally fine. And, and I think that also exists in the corporate world, like outside of the MBA. Um, there are certain engineers that are, you know, 100x multipliers, and we all have probably worked with them at some point. So they deserve to be compensated like extremely well. Um, it's funny, I, I was talking with somebody who works at Google, and Google has this thing that they say sometimes uh, where they say, oh, we like to compensate unfairly. And, and at first, I was taken a bit aback. But what they mean by that is they look for the uh, truly exceptional performers. And they say, you know what, for those people, we're willing to throw them boatloads of equity, of cash, uh, and, and we're comfortable with that because they're the ones that really, you know, bent the, the trajectory of the company. So, yeah, I, I think it is fine to say that you're truly, truly exceptional folks should get, you know, those discretionary equity grants or whatever you want to call it. Some companies call it founder awards, things like that. Um, I, I'm on board with that because of the fact that, you know, in theory, if it's a truly merit-based culture, those people bent the curve and they deserve to be rewarded. What, what what do you say to companies who who didn't take your advice to start? They they didn't have consistent comp bands across sort of roles or positions, whether in, in Sally or or equity. Have you seen people sort of renegotiate with with early team members um, to either make it more fair on, on salary or equity, or just renegotiate in the context of hey, they haven't scaled with their role, or or is that you know less likely? What would what, what you advise there? Well, I, I think it's two different conversations. Uh, you know, one is for cash or for salary. The other is for equity. For salary, you, you can fix it. And now, in general, you can't really like, you know, demote a person or like decrease their salary. Although I have seen some exceptional cases of that. But in general, 
you know, let's say you get to 60 employees or 100 employees or whenever you decide to do your first merit cycle, you basically can reestablish what all the bands are. You can re-level everybody. I encourage people to be very explicit and direct with each employee about, hey, here's our level hierarchy and here is your level and here's what you need to get to the next level. And as a result, this is where you fall in the compensation band. So for cash, that's like pretty easy to fix. We're actually going through that process right now. We have about 65 employees today. We're doing our first merit cycle and we're about to like, you know, course correct any of the early mistakes that we made in the first two years of our existence uh, with folks who might have been undercompensated on the salary side, for instance. Um, so that one you can fix. I view it less as kind of a one-way door if you mess up with salary. Sure, it's painful and it can cause inequities, but at least you can fix it. However, the equity, that's the one that it is going to be tough. Uh, it is going to be very tough to fix. Now, it, in theory, everything gets fixed, right? Eventually, like persistently, right? Because like, let's say, you know, you're given, I don't know, the market standard is like a four-year uh, vesting schedule. Uh, in theory, after four years, that initial grant that may have been outsized, maybe you know, there was some unfair compensation or negotiation where you got a, a super, super large grant. In theory, after four years, that initial grant will run dry. Uh, and then you know, you'll be fairly compensated after that point. So in theory, it eventually gets fixed. But uh, honestly, it's very tough to fix these early mistakes on the equity side. And no, to your original question, I have not seen companies like renegotiate downwards, uh, be it for salary or for equity. I've never seen a company like take back equity. So for founders that are listening here, I kind of say, you know what? Uh, maybe that was a little bit of the cost of doing business. You know, the early stage, uh, you know, founder elbow grease is sometimes what I call it needed, you know, to close those first crucial five engineers or whatever it was. In theory, you, you should try to course correct and, and fix kind of the ongoing practices that, you know, the offer letter stage as much as possible. But like if you, if you overgave equity to a few people, if they're star performers, I'm personally okay with it as a founder, because you know what, I sort of view it like binary. If those people are changing the, the trajectory of the company, it's worth every penny of that equity. However, you should absolutely think about on an ongoing basis, you know, establishing equitable practices. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. L- let's dive deeper into the, the roles of, of cash ver- versus equity in terms of h- how they've been used, how they are used, and, 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 and why those differences matter. Yeah, so it's funny. I, I think kind of in this, like some of the primary uh, technology markets in the States, you know, be it San Francisco, New York, uh, Seattle, Austin, et cetera, equity is kind of just like regarded as, yeah, that's a core part of the compensation package. Um, But then if you think about other markets in the US or other parts of the world, equity is not as well understood because it's just not as prevalent in those markets. You know, for instance, there was this big case, uh, uh, what was it? Calendly had a big exit, you know, uh, a couple months ago in in Atlanta, you know, kind of a secondary market in the US and very few employees got equity. Uh, And and that was uh, kind of this like big news story. It was like, how did these people work? At this company and not get equity. But I think it was just a testament to kind of the, the cultural differences where equity is not as highly regarded on the candidate side. And I think that's changing. We see the prevalence of equity sort of sweeping over the world. But for the most part, it's still, it's just different in different like locales around the world and around the country. So that's kind of like a high level comment. Um, as it pertains to different practices that companies adopt, they have to think strategically about the markets that they're hiring in and you know what the cost of labor is both in terms of cash and in terms of equity for the previous point I was making about you know how equity is is valued differently around the world um and then specifically from like a, a tactic standpoint um a practice that I see companies use all the time whether they're explicit about it or whether they sort of get uh, backed into a corner especially in the early stages is this notion of what I call the uh, the cash versus equity trade off and the idea here is that you know you have a a very confident candidate who comes to you and says hey, um, I I believe so much in the company, I'm willing to trade cash in exchange for more equity. I want to take a pay decrease on the salary side because I I want more ownership. And, you know, that sounds like a pretty interesting pitch. And there are a lot of companies that are very excited about this, uh, you know, sort of cash versus equity slider model. Um, What I tell companies is just be very careful about it because it goes back to the points that we were just making, which is that salary and cash it's very easy to you know, course correct that in the future, but equity is very difficult to course correct. So let's say you have two candidates, one who negotiates for more equity, the other who just sort of you know, sits in the status quo with their first offer. Um, well, the, the candidate that got a lot more equity, let's say the company 10Xs, suddenly they're going to have like an outsized amount of ownership in the company versus the, the other candidate that did not negotiate. And that can lead to this very icky situation culturally, it can lead to a pay in equity. So um, I, I'm not saying that companies should not do this notion of the cash versus equity slider, because uh, it's like a very interesting idea of giving optionality to the candidate to dictate what they want their compensation to be. But I would would strongly advise that companies go into it eyes wide open 
And they also set up very defined guardrails for how big kind of that sliding scale is. Otherwise, the inequities will just be very, very large. And it's sort of a very slippery slope that you can never erase. Yeah. So zooming out again, what other advice do you have for founders looking to, 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 to make their next hire or, or other mistakes that you see uh, people make that they sh- or non-obvious things that they should perhaps do differently? So we talked about, you know, the, the notion of consistency and having that kind of like same philosophy for everyone. But the, the second big thing that I would say is, is like the crucial uh, aspect of this equation is really nailing the equity narrative. Uh, and there's a lot of art to this. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of math and science in terms of, you know, stock options, strike price, et cetera. But the, the real, uh, you know, thing a founder needs to master is what that equity narrative is at any given time. And the equity narrative that you tell to a seed stage uh, candidate versus a series B stage candidate versus a series D versus like a FANG or a public company candidate is so, so different, right? A public company RSU that you get is liquid. The day it vests, you could sell it. You can buy a car, you can send your kid to college, you can put it in the S&P 500. But the day, you know, uh, an option, an ISO grant uh, starts to vest from a seed stage startup, it, it doesn't have de facto liquidity. However, it has much, much higher upside. So kind of for that person that wants to join the seed stage startup, a lot of the, the equity narrative, and it's different for every single company because there are so many factors that influence the narrative. But in general, like a, a good way to frame it is thinking about what I call generational ownership, right? Um, if you want to change your life, but not only your life, and but your, your entire family's life, your kid's life, you need ownership. Ownership is the key to doing that. And that's what you can get at a seed stage startup. So, you know, a lot of my rhetoric in the early days was, was all about that, as well as just ownership in the company and the uh, ability to really, you know, dictate what the company does in the future. Um, now we're kind of at the series B stage for us and, and my equity narrative or the rhetoric is a lot more about the sweet spot. That's kind of what I call it now. It's like, you know, the company has been a little bit de-risked, right? Like we have revenue, we have a team, we have executives, uh, we have good finding or uh, good financing behind us. Um, however, uh, we still have a lot of upside, like a lot more upside than if you were to go and join Apple or Facebook or Amazon or something like this, right? I can tell you a, a credible path to hundred X in our valuation. Uh, Facebook cannot do that, right? 100x in their valuation would be $100 trillion, more or less. And then maybe the equity narrative for like a much larger company, you know, let's call it a Series D, E, F startup, you know, pre-IPO, is probably about the notion of, hey, look, we're about to get this IPO boost and you're going to have that de facto liquidity. Or maybe a lot of late stage private companies these days are offering liquidity via, uh, via like structured secondaries or buybacks. So, you know, the point is that the equity narrative is always changing. Uh, and that is truly the art to closing candidates at the different stages in the company's trajectory and training your hiring managers to do the same. Nail that equity narrative, understand how to make it a credible, a transparent, a believable story that candidates really buy into, because that is the magic of Silicon Valley and the magic of stock options. It's, it's ownership. It's the notion that you can, you know, invest your time as a candidate in a company uh, and then have ownership. And that ownership can be really, really impactful on your overall net worth and, and personal financial situation. Yeah, totally. And and, and, and to pull on a, a, a related thread, how should founders think about option pools? So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was like a whole black art for me. I, I didn't even like realize it was going to be a part of the negotiation uh, for a, a financing until our series A, where, you know, I got a term sheet and then sent it to our lawyers and they were like, oh, you should negotiate for you know, a smaller post-closing option pool. And I was like, smaller, wouldn't I want it to be bigger? But they were like, no, you want to dilute yourself and the existing employees a little bit less. So um, I didn't even realize like how this worked uh, from like an economic standpoint until I I was kind of like uh, out in the wild. So, you know, the way I thought about it at that time, and it was the same thing with our series B, is I texted a few other founders, I texted a few investors, uh, and I just tried to do some research on market benchmarks. So, I, you know, that, that was kind of one of the foundational aspects of my rhetoric when I was trying to negotiate with the, uh, you know, the investors who led our, our Series A and Series B financings. So that was one part. And then also, I, I had tried to think from a very pragmatic standpoint, okay, well, you know, how long do we think this fundraise, you know, the money, how long is it going to last us? Um, how many executives do we want to hire between now and then? Um, you know, how, how many employees do we want to hire? So I tried to do some rough math about, like, how many options we would want to give out. Uh, and then, yeah, those two things combined. I basically came back to the investors for each of these financings, had a very like logical sort of like uh, bottoms up analysis of how much equity we wanted to spend, as well as what the market benchmarks were. And, and that was basically the underlying uh, rhetoric for uh, basically how, how much I negotiated for. Because obviously, the founder interest is to negotiate down. Uh, the, the investor interest is generally to negotiate up. So that, that was kind of some high level context. And then since our Series B, it's been, I don't know, three, four months or something like that. I'll tell you the truth, Eric, it's kind of a black box to me in terms of how much we've spent. Are we on track? Are we above track? Are we below track? 
we have a fractional CFO who's amazing. And she just did a quick analysis to sort of say, Matt, like, here's how much of it you spent. But it gets so messy because if you fire an employee or an employee quits, like you sort of reclaim that equity. And it, it's still honestly a black box to me. So uh, point is, I think it's a huge pain point and a huge problem. And it's actually one that we're pretty well suited to solve because we integrate with companies cap tables and can we, we can really help from like a, a financial planning standpoint. So that's absolutely something that paved software intends to solve, you know, over the next year or so once we have a chance to build it. Yeah, that, that'd be really helpful. We, will, <laughs> we use it a lot at, at, at on deck. Happy, happy customer for sure. And it, it, from the employee side, it's really interesting because we're seeing, you know, founders say, hey, we, we want a higher valuation because employees, you know, it's more favorable to employees. And, and, and some people are saying, wait a minute, if the valuation is higher, that means, you know, in theory, less room to, to grow the valuation. And also the strike price is less favorable at a, at a higher valuation. Are, are you seeing that too, in terms of employees preferring the, the higher valuation? And is this you know, somewhat, um, you know, paradoxical or, or short-sighted or how do you, how do you explain it? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're alluding to like, you know, an extension of what we we're talking before this equity narrative is it, so complex and it's important that you have a command of all the facts and then know how to like frame the narrative in a very credible and like honest way. Because if, if you're trying to sell a used car, you know, somebody's going to sniff that you're trying to sell a lemon, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, one way to look at it is what you sort of outlined, which is the notion of if, if you raise more money, you have more money to give to candidates. So in theory, it can afford things like, you know, big signing bonuses or higher salaries. Um, it, the company's a little bit more de-risked in theory because it's raised more money. Um, also, like the gross equity value of the grants that you can give based off the latest sort of like market assessment of what the company is worth, the, the gross equity values can be much higher. And those can be like a, a lot more interesting for a candidate coming from maybe like the, the bang world that is used to just those like liquid RSUs. They might be looking for what the gross equity value is. However, to your point, it also generally means that the percent ownership is probably going to be a little bit lower uh, if, if the company's valuation has gone up. Our philosophy as a company is we're just transparent about all the facts. And I try to like give them both the pros and the cons. That generally wins the favor of the candidates. Of course, you could like really try to lean into one narrative or the other. Um, I, I just try to take a little bit more of a transparent approach. But it, it, it's very tricky. Like a, a very recent example is that I, I've been talking with a candidate and, you know, we've been talking about the gross equity value. Our most recent valuation was $400 million. Um, but we raised that round or we signed the term sheet in April. And in theory... You know, our company has been a little bit de-risked since then, and the, the revenue has gone up, and you know, other aspects of the company have changed. So I'm trying to make the argument of like, look, this this grant was priced at the uh, you know the valuation from four, five, six months ago, but the company is a different company than it was back then. However, that's a little bit of a hand wavy rhetoric. So while I'm going to definitely give that rhetoric, it's still like not fully solidified by a new valuation in the market. So yeah, point is, it, it's kind of tricky, and there there are so many factors that go into what this equity narrative could be. And you're right, a candidate could argue in one way and the founder could argue in the other way. So I, I don't think there's a clear cut and dry answer here. Matt, this was uh, this was very helpful. For, for people who want to uh, learn more, go deeper and and check out Pave, Pave a little bit. Uh, to, to tell us uh, how, how it works and, uh, and how people can use it. Yeah, absolutely. So there's kind of two different aspects to our business. Uh, one of them is free and, and we strongly encourage everyone to take advantage of it. The second is a, a paid aspect of our, our platform. So I'll start with the first one. It's called our benchmarking product. Uh, we currently have about 13 company, 1,300 companies rather, who have integrated their HR systems like their Gusto, their Rippling, their Carta, their Shareworks, uh, whatever it is. Uh, and they've joined this kind of future of online compensation data. So uh, they, they share their anonymized employee data. We do all the hard process to integrate the data, to normalize it, to you know, handle the, the leveling of employees between different companies. And then we expose this kind of uh, aggregate market layer where Companies can see, you know, what is a software engineer making today in San Francisco or in Austin, Texas, or, you know, a VP of marketing in Boulder, Colorado. So um, that is free. The, the price to play per se is integrating your systems. And, you know, we're currently at about 1300 companies, like I said. Uh, and then we have a, a second set of products that we do uh, charge for. One of them is a compensation planning product. Uh, it helps companies with merit cycles. Another is what we call the communication pillar that helps companies with total reward statements, as well as visual offer letters. And um, yeah, generally speaking, the sweet spot is for companies that have at least 100 employees uh, or more, but uh, we are willing to work with some smaller companies as well. So if you're at all curious, feel free to shoot me an email, uh, matt at pave.com. If nothing else, I'm just always uh, eager to get feedback from the market and uh, grateful grateful for the time here today, Eric. And uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to also shoot me an email. Awesome. Uh, well, happy investor, ha happy customer here, uh, Matt. Thanks so much for, for coming to the podcast. It's been a great episode. Great. Thanks, Eric.
if you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Check us out at villageglobal.vc.